we're, we're ready to start. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to my session. Who here is, uh, owns a business? Okay. Who wants to own a business? Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. Um, because, um, well, when I submitted this talk, I thought I was going to talk about startups. Well, I've been doing this startup talk quite a few times. Um, but then, um, uh, what I really want to talk about is productized services. And, and, what, and, and I'll explain a little bit later what that means. Um, uh, because productized services are kind of like startups, but uh, easier. And, and I'll explain in a moment why. <clears throat> but the ultimate goal is the same. It's all about how do you get from doing a lot of work um, for other people, building other people's products, to um, changing it to um, how can I build something that generates money without always having to invest as much time. So that's the ultimate goal. It's like, how can you multiply your, um, your uh, return on investment? How can you multiply your return on the same amount of, of work that you're doing? First, a small word about myself. I'm uh, Christophe van Tomme. I'm a Belgian. I used to say that I'm a Belgian from Hungary because I lived uh, five years in Hungary. And my business is, um, like, I, I work currently uh, only with people in Hungary, weird enough. <laughs> um, at least for, for, for um, employees. And um, um, we are, we're a Drupal agency. Um, we've been dabbling in products, and um, a lot of the talk is informed by my personal experiences trying to make a product, trying to get to this dream. Um, and it's a long, difficult road. But uh, I'll, yeah, as I said, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, if you're looking for the slides, um, the up-to-date version of these slides are at that URL. And um, yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure if it's open for commenting. Sometimes I open these up for comments, but nobody ever did, so I stopped doing that. Act one. Last year in August, our business was in trouble. Um, we had uh, we had a large customer that um, suddenly really reduced their business with us. And um, we had been working very hard on a product uh, called WalkHub, um, but it was not getting product market fit. And this is the nightmare scenario when you're doing products, by the way, is <clears throat> you've got a, a finite runway and uh, you're not getting to product market fit, so you're, um, you know, like, People say that they want to use your product, but then they don't. People pay you for your product, and then they don't use it. Like we have one person who paid us a thousand dollar to use our product, and as far as I know, he hasn't. He still hasn't used our product. Thousand um, dollar. Um, and um, so, in the, and when that happens, you have to like start really asking difficult questions. Is this the right product that we're building? Um, uh, you have to be very careful that you don't start adding features, more and more features, because that just doesn't work either. Um, and um, yeah, well, the, the bottom line was that we had to refocus on our consulting work. Um, and uh, right at the same time, there were two other Hungarian consulting companies that, had, that were in similar pickle that came to me like, you know, we're looking for more work. Do, do, Christoph, do you have anything you can give us? And um, and I was like, well, not really right now. <laughs> but, um, you, but you know what? We'll start working together. We'll build this big, like, big alliance. We'll, we'll call it Hussar, uh, you know, the Hussar. You, you know those? It, it was uh, the Hungarian um, uh, cavalry, like the, the guys on the horses that do all these crazy s stuff, like uh, standing on their horseback and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 when I started looking for it, when I did my research about the alliance, I found out that it was also uh, Polish. Um, I don't know, were they as crazy as the Hungarians? Well, like, like, because the, these guys, they're like standing on horseback and shooting arrows, like, they're insane. Anyway, so we thought that would be kind of cool uh, for, for the alliance, and, um, 
and I was going to do sales. And, um, you know, the way I've done sales until now is mostly networking. So I started networking like crazy in Belgium because I'm a Belgian and so far we didn't do much sales in Belgium. I started meetups and a bunch of other stuff. Now, you can ask if that is the best way of doing sales. Um, probably it's not, um, or it's not enough. Um, you, you need to do other things next to that. But, um, but I, I, you know, that's, that's what I knew best, and, and that's what I started doing. This also takes a lot of time. Um, but before I continue my story, I'd like to do a small intermezzo. Well, actually, a large intermezzo, because this is the meat of my presentation. I'd like to talk to you about business strategy. And um, I'd like to talk to you about positioning. I don't know if you've heard of the three Ps. Do you know the three Ps? Product. Almost. <laughs> Product, well, I, won't, I won't put you on the spot. Uh, Product, people, and process. Those are the three Ps. This is kind of like uh, MBA 101. Probably one of the most important things. Probably if you know this, you can go and read online and get as much value as an MBA. No, maybe. OK, I shouldn't. I hope nobody here got an MBA. No, OK. <laughs> but um, um, these are like the three important parts of any business. And if the three Ps work, then probably you have a good business. Um, there's, a, there's a show um, titled um, The Profit. Anybody seen that? It's, a, it's an American show. It's really good. It's, a, it's an investor who goes to businesses that are failing, and he helps them. And he like, always starts with like, the three Ps, like who are the people, what's the process, you know. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the profit, it's called. And um, um, it's, a, it's a good show. It's not like Dragon's Den that's very aggressive and kind of like um, It's pretty tough also, but it's, it, yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, but besides the three Ps, there's a fourth P, or at least in marketing, that's what people will tell you. And the fourth P is positioning. And I, like, it's taken me a long while. Um, I, I, I never, well, we did marketing, but it was like community marketing, like what I'm doing now, going to events, doing blog posts, that kind of stuff. We never really thought about traditional kind of marketing. But I'm, I'm like, the longer I'm running this business, the more I get um, to really feel that it's super important. That it's probably one of the most important things. Sales and marketing, without it, as, as soon as you hit a certain scale, um, it doesn't work um, because your 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 uh, revenue is too unpredictable. Um, the best part about um, positioning is that it makes you referable, because if you're specialized in one very specific thing. People remember that, uh, and and they can much easier tell when somebody else then asks or talks about something. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, I remember that guy or the girl that did X Y Z, and and um, yeah, probably should meet them." And um, um, and it's especially like we are a business. We we uh, we work not with one specific market, so we we don't work for only Belgians. Like most Drupal shops are are locally. Um, organized. They work for one specific market. It's like, you know, they'll be doing Swiss customers or they work for Swiss customers or Belgian customers or so on and so on. Um, but we are not like that because we, we are more, like we work more internationally. And because of that, our market is very distributed. And because of that, um, just being a Drupal shop is not enough. Uh, because there's too many Drupal shops. You're not distinguishable anymore. Um, and um, and it, it's like people, it's much harder to refer you because they know at least two other Drupal shops and then probably they'll pick one that's a bit closer to home. Um, so, and, um, uh, but there's other ways to position. So you, you can position regionally and go for like a geographic market or you can position in an industry segment and focus in one specific type of, of uh, solutions. Now, positioning gets you also economies of scale. And positioning can also help you to make more money for the same amount of work. Because you get much better at what you're doing, and you're doing it over and over and over again, and you can charge more money for the work that you're doing. But there's a catch. Just like the photo, photo industry, 
Um, uh, like before digital cameras, there was this giant industry of doing that we're all doing camera rolls, and that completely evaporated in a few years. So when you position, when you pick one specific market, you have to be careful because that can disappear from today to tomorrow. Because positioning makes you fragile. Who here knows what's the opposite of fragile? What do you think? Any, any ideas? Who? Tough? Yeah? Stable? Yeah. yeah. That's not the opposite. No. Fragile is something that becomes worse from randomness. Something random happens and it gets destroyed. Robust, solid, flexible, all these words, they stay the same. So when something random happens, they just, they don't care, they stay the same. The opposite of fragile would, would be something that gets stronger from randomness, right? Um, agile, well, maybe. <laughs> It's anti-fragile. Is is uh, is uh, anybody read the book? Uh, read the book anti-fragile? Okay, great. Um, this is one of the most important learning points in my presentation. Uh, if you can remember one thing, is the word anti-fragile, and to go probably you should read the book or at least read up about it because I think it's one of the most important business strategy um, items that I've read in the last ten years. So, because in times like this, in times like today, that are incredibly turbulent, right? Things are changing all the time. Um, things are speeding up. You don't know if the industry that you're, you're starting in today is going to survive in 5, 10, 20 years from now. You don't know. You can't know. Because it's changing so fast that it becomes unpredictable. And when, you, when, you're, when you're in an environment like that, it's very dangerous to be a specialist. You can see this in cities. In cities, the animals that are surviving, they're not the specialists, right? It's not the thistle finks, I, finch? I, I don't know if that's even a word in, in, in English. Uh, it's a um, um, distelvink in Dutch. Um, they, they don't live in cities. The animals that live in cities are pigeons, rats, and cockroaches. They're all generalists, right? Now. I'm not saying that you should be a generalist, because it's also not good. Because as a generalist, you can't focus, you can't you know, um, specialize and become very, very strong in a specific area. You can't really increase your returns. You just survive. The generalists survive. They're very good at surviving. Um, but um, yeah, that was a little detour. Because what I want to come back to is, is this anti-fragile concept. Um, because in turbulent times like today, actually, you should try to be anti-fragile. What does that mean? People are anti-fragile by nature. If something really bad happens to you, and you're, um, you have grit, so, and, and, you, you know, and you're not psychologically down, then you bounce back. People will always bounce back. Ecosystems bounce back. Like you, 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 even if you would throw uh, a nuclear bomb on, um, on a city, the ants would survive, and I, I don't know. Nature always comes back. Um, <clears throat> and businesses are like that also, or it can be like that, if they're built the right way. So it's, there's a concept of, of uh, building a business in such a way that it can gain from this order. One example that you might know is a chaos monkey. Uh, you heard about this? No? And Netflix has, has a, a software application that randomly shuts down parts of its infrastructure. What? <laughs> Have you, you didn't hear about this? This is crazy. Right? And, um, but because it randomly shuts down stuff all the time, they're much better protected against the time that something really would go bad. Because they're prepared. They're ready to react. That's anti-fragile. This is how you become anti-fragile. And as I said earlier, like um, ecosystems, uh, animals, they're, they're, they have that. They have that nature. You've seen it in, in action. Like you've, you've, um, you know, you've done too much sporting and be sore and then got stronger. Like all of us have done that. 
uh, you've hit the wall and, and then stood up and run further. Uh, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're doing this. Um, um, there's, and there's, there's a few very interesting things in, in this book uh, that you can learn from. Like one is you can outsource anti uh, fragility. You can give your fragility to somebody else. The way that works, this is how ecosystems work, also how our body works, is that we're a collection of smaller units and any of those units can die, no problem. And whenever they die, the organism becomes stronger, right? For example, if you have a population of, of um, people or animals or whatever, and there's a plague, like this ha actually happened here in Europe uh, during the plague, um, people, like lots of people died. But the people that remained had some sort of trait because of which they were stronger, because of which they were able to withstand that plague. And when plague came around next time, less people died. And this is how anti-fragility works. It's, um, protection of the group by uh, sac sacrifice of the individuals. Um, this, this example, do you know what this is? This is a Darwin finch. They're the birds that Darwin, uh, well, one of the, the species that Darwin used to, under, to understand how evolutionary theory works. And it's one species of bird, but they have uh, different subspecies with different beaks. And one of them eat like, I, I think it's like cacti, and then one eats insects, and one eats uh, seeds. And it, it's like they, they eat different things. Um, and the species as a whole, Darwin finches, are, are stronger because there's these subspecies. And if any of those food sources disappears, the whole species will still survive because there's these other subspecies that can repopulate um, the, the new uh, ecological niche that, that appears. Any Belgians here? Yeah. Do you know this? Probably you don't know this company. Few people in Belgium know this company also. Um, Kronos Group is an example of, of this kind of um, system, but in a business group. What they do, they got um, the Kronos Group, and every year they spin off a bunch of companies. Like, um, I think it's like 10 companies a year or something like that. Uh, they have a total of three or 4,000 employees like across the group. And what they do, like when Drupal became a big thing in Belgium, they spun up three Drupal companies. And they just let them, let them see who survives. Uh, if any of these companies gets in trouble, they just close it down, take the employees, put them in another company. And, and it's, a, it's a way of, of redistributing resources and, and becoming stronger. Uh, without sacrificing the anti-fragility of the, the mother company. So what it means is that, um, because if you have a really big company, there's a lot of risks. Because if, like, um, uh, you remember that story about the trader who, um, who made this incredible bet on the stock exchange, and then it, didn't it fell through, and a bank lost like a billion dollar? Have you heard that story? Like, this is the kind of risks of size. If you, become, if you come, become really large, you become more fragile. So by having these units, having a sort of cell mechanism in your business, you can, become, um, uh, you can, become, you can remain um, anti-fragile while having a larger organization. I would love to build a business like this. Not like this exactly, so I, because they give very little percentage to their entrepreneurs, I, I, but I, uh, like my big dream is to build kind of like a swarm of companies that is um, with a bunch of really cool entrepreneurs that are my tribe, and that's you know we we shore each other up something like that. Anyway, I'm still figuring out how to do it. But how does this work? Um, how 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 does anti-fragility work in this case? I I, I gave the example of. Um, of uh, evolutionary pressure when an illness is there. This is like, but, but how do you explain bats and dolphins that, are, that have like a shared ancestor somewhere far, far, far away in history? Like how do, how do, you, how do you explain that? The, because you, you would almost, and this is why a, a lot of religious people say like, you know, this is just designed. Um, but you can actually explain this by making small bats. This is how nature does it. 
They make it, uh, nature makes a ton of small bets with asymmetrical risks. So what it does, nature has a mutation. There's a, there's a different animal. Most likely, it's less fit. But sometimes, it's like it has something weird because of which it's especially fit in a certain area. And then maybe it starts eating one specific plant, and then you know, little by little by little, it becomes uh, a, different, a different species. This is also what you can do as an entrepreneur. Instead of making one big bet in one single product, you can make a lot of small bets in a bunch of different niches. Now, I'm not telling you to spread your attention across a bunch of different things, but you, you could, you, because then you don't make small bets. You need to make um, bets that, that cost you very little to implement, um, but that have a really, really large potential upside. So if things go well, you're going to do really well. It's kind of like the way VCs do it. right? They also outsource their fragility to startups. This is why it's not good to take VC money, by the way, because you're, you're the fragile part in the business. Now, there's even talk that this way of working with optionality is the way intelligence works. Imagine. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's this, there's this uh, equation on the board. Uh, this is about, um, um, like, what was it, entropy pressure, and it's very, very high stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, I never get my head wrapped around entropy, no matter how many times I look at it, um, I th especially because of information theory, because you've got two types of entropy, and it completely messes me up. But the interesting thing here is that um, intelligence is a force to maximize future optionality. They figured out a program, like a computer program. This was a TED Talk. Uh, it's a computer program, and the only thing it does is to increase its future optionality. It's not smart. Uh, like they, they don't program any routines in it. But it's still able to play a bunch of games and do a bunch of really complex behavior that you normally would only expect from an intelligent system. It's kind of weird. Uh, and the only thing it does is increase its future optionality. It's keeping as much options open as possible. But here's the pickle. <laughs> because how do you combine specialization with maximum optionality? Right? That's hard. And because if you don't specialize, you can't survive. Because you need specialization. Uh, to be able to, maxima to, to uh, maximize what you can gain from the environment. And if there's a bunch of parties competing in an environment, it's the specialists that win, because they are better adapted to a specific environment. But at the same time, they're more vulnerable, because if that environment disappears, it's over. Right? But how, so how do you do that? Well, this is how nature does it, again. Um, the, um, if, you have a uh, if you have a tree, a tree doesn't know where it sows its seeds. It just throws a bunch of seeds, like thousands or ten thousands of seeds, and then it just lets grow whatever will grow. And then those that grow, they become the next generation, often, often just purely by chance. It's this asymmetrical risk profile. Now, who knows Zapier? Have you seen Zapier? Anybody? No? If this, then that. Yeah, if this and that you've seen. So this is, an, this is a, a sort of middleware software. Now, kind of interesting. Um, but the really interesting thing they do is um, the way that they built their business. Because um, two, three years ago, I was looking for uh, an integration. I think it was between Google Docs and Trello or something like that. So I Google it. It's like, oh, yes, it exists. And then I start looking, it's like, oh, no, it doesn't exist. They just made a landing page. Uh, so they made like thousands or tens of thousands of landing pages for all the possible combinations between systems, and then just waited to see which ones people were clicking on and which ones people were actually giving their email addresses for. And it was like, this is brilliant. <laughs> it's just a brilliant idea. Uh, because this way, you can identify where there is a market for whatever you're going to build. And this is, like, this is another really important point that I had to learn the hard way. Is um, I, I'm not sure if I already learned it completely. <laughs> uh, 
But um, if you're going to build something, start with your market. Like find out where there is market pool. Because if, um, y even if you have a really brilliant idea and it's per perfectly executed, if there's no market, you know, game over. The way that we're doing this, similar to this, we do this in the Drupal community. We've got, um, I got a blog post up about car sharing, like a distribution for car sharing. What I did there, I, got a, I, have, I have got a friend, and he wanted to build, uh, well, he's building a startup, uh, a car sharing startup in, uh, in Belgium. And I was talking with him about, um, like, why not build the software as an open source project so that other car sharing services would be able to collaborate and that we could increase the amount of cars, uh, like, you know, shared cars in a much faster way. Because one of the biggest hurdles when you're starting a car sharing business is, um, like, getting a software up. He really liked the idea, so I wrote a blog post. That was a really small investment, right? It was two, three hours of my time. And, and we published it, and we, we, we had a, a call to action in it, where like um, um, a form where people could submit if they were interested in it. And we only got like five or six people. So we knew that we shouldn't continue. We knew that we didn't have to build that product because there was too little interest, and there were, it was not strong enough. Now, if this would have been me five years ago, I would have started building the distribution first and then come out like, ta-da, we've got this distribution for car sharing, and, and nobody would have cared. And this is, this is probably my, uh, yeah, my biggest caution for you if you're thinking about startups. Be careful that you're, you're not doing that. Well, that you're doing this rather than the other thing. But um, I also promised that I would talk a little bit about productized services. Who here heard about that word, productized services? Yeah, only one? Yeah. Um, you, um, do you know the Tropical MBA? It's, uh, this morning there was a talk about working remote, and like working while traveling. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff and productized services, uh, check out the Tropical MBA. It's a, it's a podcast about uh, making location independent businesses. Very interesting. Now, they talk about productized services. And um, the reason why I think that's super important in open source community is because open source software is like a platform. Uh, because you're not going to make any money from your software, not the software itself, because you're giving it away. So you need to build something on top of that. And when you're looking at product, process, people, like if the product is free, then you have process and people left to make your money with. Um, hopefully, you have got good people. But one other th area that you probably should be looking at is how to improve your process. And if you do a really good process, that can almost become like a product. And what I mean with that is if you can find a very specific niche and um, make a process that's repeatable and uh, that's easy to communicate, and then people will say, oh, that sounds really good. That sounds like. It's, um, it's adding a lot of value on top of the product, then you can, uh, you can build a business purely on productized services. That's, that's what that means. One example, Word, a WP curve. You've heard of that? Any WordPress people here? <laughs> like after this morning's talk. <laughs> um, um, product, um, so WP curve is a company that is specialized in support for WordPress sites. And they charge, hold, hold on to your seat, $100 a month for unlimited tickets, as long as the tickets are not more than half an hour work. Weird, right? And it works. That's a business that actually works. And they can give unlimited tickets. And um, now I've been thinking about how to do that in Drupal, but I'm still not out of it. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know, it would be hard. But, um, uh, but the way that that works is there, it's a service. It's purely a service. But because of the way that it's structured, it becomes repeatable. It becomes a product. And that's, that's, that's what a product as service is. Now, 
I believe that Drupal is a great market for, um, for this kind of stuff. Uh, because Drupal, well, I'm, I'm a bioengineer, as you, if you didn't realize yet. <laughs> um, so I, I've got a biotech background. But um, Drupal is kind of like a coral reef. You know? And a coral reef, there's all these cavities, and you've got like big spaces and small places. And, and because of this, lots of niches in, in, in the structure, in, in the ecology, you got a lot of possibilities for, for growing uh, different businesses. And Drupal is like that, because we're pretty much, I think we're in almost every sector, there are something you can do with Drupal. And um, um, so there's a lot of possibilities. Um, this is why I'm not afraid to share all of this stuff with you. <laughs> what we are doing, for example, have you heard of, of uh, DITA before? Darwin Information Type Architecture. It's um, a very geeky, XML standard for technical writers, um, write the docs. Um, it's, um, um, it's a tool that's used by really large companies to make um, um, documentation that can be translated cheaply and that can be reused. So now I've, I've been in that sector for four or five years now. So one of the productized services we're working on is how to put DITA into Drupal. And most of the thing we're doing is some small customization, mostly feeds, and a process of working with it, um, knowledge about how to do that, and a marketing. Uh, and that's, that's, that's about it. You don't have to build a full product for that. You can just build a service package. We're also working on a landing page product. This is uh, on top of Paragraphs module. These two together, we're using to make developer portals for technology companies. So this is the niche that we are specializing in, is um, um, API portals and that kind of stuff. Uh, we're still rebranding and, and working on our, our marketing. We're still testing. But this, um, uh, this is a strategy that we're, we're picking. So but I, I promised you that I would tell you the end of my story. Right? So from the three companies that started out, um, we're like one fell off, um, and it's a long story. I won't tell it here. But um, we ended up with two companies, and we we um, we're halfway through a merger. Uh, it's like we've been working together for more than a year now, and um, um, I think early next year the merger will be finalized. And it's been really good because, as you might have heard, I'm a, an ID fountain. I'm always looking for new ideas. I'm always scanning the horizon for new stuff. I'm a sower. I, I, I figure out new things. And when you're a sower, you also need a reaper. And this is one of the other key things that I would like you to remember, is if you're going to start a business um, and you're a sower, make sure you find a reaper. And because if you don't, then you're always switching between these roles. Like you have to sow a bit, and then you have to go and find business to pull in the money, and then you have to sow a bit more. And, and it's very hard to keep switching. And it's, if you can find someone who is your complement, it's much easier. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very lucky that I found somebody like that. Um, we've also built a second version of WalkHub. It's now built in Go. Uh, because it's a long story, but basically uh, people were concerned about having a backend in Drupal for a small microservice. Like it was too heavy for its purpose. And, uh, and we get much better feedback now uh, about Go. Uh, we, we had a stand at OSCON. Um, also, like I talked about developer portals, uh, one of the things we're doing is API implementations for technology companies. Uh, we won uh, the Contextio uh, DevPost challenge. Uh, we won $25,000 for a Drupal module that we built. And uh, of course, we keep continue fishing <laughs> uh, for new niches. Um, so that one day in the future, I can have this swarm of companies that are doing all different things, but that are still uh, helping and protecting each other. That's kind of the end of my talk. Got two more things. Uh, one. If you, have, if you haven't heard of this before, D8 Upgrade, this is something we give away to the community. If you run your own business, go check it out, because you can use it to get um, 
an upgrade report about a site. You just get the URL, plug it in there, and it gives you a free report. It's also made so that um, the, um, the reports, uh, like if you can embed it on your site, and then you'll get to know what, uh, what customers have, have been submitting their sites to you. So it's a tool for, for building business. And we play nice with you, you know, read the letters. Uh, uh, very nice, actually. The other thing, if you're trying to learn Drupal 8, we've got this partnership with Outlearn, and we're doing free Drupal trainings. And it's like a learning management system. So you can actually like fulfill the steps and learn Drupal 8. Uh, so it's another thing to check out. And um, that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Are there any questions? I had the after lunch dip slot. So <laughs> I hope you had your coffee. <laughs> yeah? Sure. It's not accessible. Uh, probably I did set a permission. Uh, I'll do that after. Yeah. And I'll test it. And else I'll tweet it. Uh, I'll tweet it also. Um, uh, that's my Twitter name there. Other questions? Yeah? <laughs> Everything is evolutionary. <laughs> it's 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 um, well. I, I'm a I'm a bioengineer, right? I'm, I'm I've got a bias. <laughs> I, I got a I got a biology problem. Um, but um, this anti-fragile book that I got through startup community, and. Um, and when you start reading it, it explains why and how evolutionary theory works, and then how you can apply that uh, to 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 really turbulent times like we have today. Um, so and that's yeah, and it just fits really nice together. Uh, it fits well. It's a good story for me to tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that any complex adapt any complex system that is truly adaptive, probably is going to use one of these strategies. They'll probably have a bunch of different prototypes that they're trying, and then seeing which ones work. I think, yeah. Well, being more agile as a business, the best thing is this uh, cell, cell philosophy, uh, where you uh, like well, I didn't tell that, but uh, the Kronos group, when you get to a certain size, if you get over 30, it's probably time to split. So they don't let businesses grow bigger than a certain size, which is very interesting. It's counterintuitive. Most businesses wouldn't do that. So that, that's, that's part of the answer, I think. Yeah? Other questions? No? Okay. So thank you very much.